Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God for another opportunity where we can share the Word of God, where we can listen, where we can meditate upon the Word of God. So I ask you to now pay attention to what God is going to be saying to you. And God speaks to every one of us through the Word of God. It is only through the Word of God that God is able to speak to us. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us for the times we have not listened to your voice and respond to your way. But we have followed our own ways and have been influenced by the things that dishonor your name. Keep us low at the cross and broken before you. Open our eyes to hear your voice and open eyes so that we may follow in your ways. As we consider Israel's failure to listen to your word, and obey your voice, help us to be attentive to all that you would teach us. And may we honor your name in all we are and all we do, to your praise and glory. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are going to hear the Bible reading coming from the book of Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 1 to 13. And Brother Ben is going to do the reading. Thank you, Brother Ben. I just thank the Lord for this wonderful opportunity to be able to read the word to you. And uh, I pray that you'll be blessed by this word. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, Jeremiah chapter 2, 1 to 13. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness. Through, though I stand, <laughs> through a land not sown, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty and disaster overtook them. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all, your, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me, that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord? Who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness? Through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives, I brought you into the fertile land to eat its fruits and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. Therefore I bring charge against you again. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are, are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me at the spring of living water and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And this is the word of the Lord for this week. Uh, let's get Johnson back to share with us what God has put on his heart. Thanks, Johnson. Uh, <clears throat> greetings to you once again. Um, today I've decided to share with you on the theme, when the honeymoon is over. When the honeymoon is over. In marriage, people speak of honeymoon, period. A time during which each spouse is eager to please the other. This illusionment often sets in when the honeymoon period is over. 
God recalled a time when Israel was his eager bride, happy to be faithful to him. We also have a honeymoon period in our relationship with God, a time when we are eager to please him and focus on him. By taking time daily to seek God and surrender to him, we can keep our love relationship growing every day. Temptations will lose their power to divert us if we daily surrender our lives to God's control. Jeremiah recalled how the people of Israel soon forgot who saved them from their bondage in Egypt. As a result, they wandered for years in the wilderness. Without God, we also will find ourselves wandering in a terrible wilderness. Drifting into sinful, selfish ways is a certainty with God's help to keep us on the right path. Now the Lord asks him why he has changed. Why she has changed. The people, priests, the rulers, and prophets, have forgotten all God did for them. You can see from the reading, unlike such heathen lands as Cyprus and Cana, who are loyal to their gods, Judas forsaken the Lord their God for worthless idols. Why have they forsaken their God? Is a question we need to answer. After God had blessed them and given them a good land, they returned, they turned from him. As Osiah said of the northern kingdom, Ephraim worked the fat and, for, and wicked. In their comfortable and sophisticated society, they turned away from the living God to serve idols. One cannot tell but note that there is an analogy between Judah and our own nations. Our own nation, God is left out. See what is happening these days. Even God is left out in our parliaments today. God is left out in our community. God is left out in our schools. God is being left out everywhere. They don't want to hear about God. Our nations were built by men and women who believed that the book was the word of God and everything they did was based on the book. But today, our nations are controlled by men and women who do not know their spiritual heritage, who do not know their spiritual foundation. We have turned away from God. We are going after the idol of the Alamite money, dollar, to speak so. People are after money these days. You talk about anything, as long as it gives them money, it's okay. Money is the God of the present hour. Ephesians 19 verse 28, you hear the Ephesians chanted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The cry of most of us is money, and God is left out. I remember thee, God says, I remember thee when you really loved me so much. They had forgotten him, but God had not forgotten him. Oh, how gracious God is. God still remembers us. God still knows how we started. Without doubt, this is one of the greatest passages of Scripture. Notice the wonderful way in which God approaches them. What did I do wrong that have turned away from me? That is the question. What did I do wrong that have turned away from me? In our day, my friend, what is wrong with God that we are not more interested in him? What is wrong with God that we are no longer even to want to hear about God? Why are we not serving him? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God doing something wrong today? He asked, what iniquity have your fathers found in me that they've deserted me? What is it that I've done that they've left me? In this time and place, God was upset because people had tried. God's very own people had turned away. They had gone after worthless things, following idols, things that seemed important but real weren't, things that seemed to matter but really didn't. They wasted lots of time and lots of energy going after the, see, these things, going after these idols. In the end, it seems they also wasted a lot of themselves. They have nothing tangible to hold on. Pursuing worthless things, it seems, only makes you worthless in the end. Why would people do that? Why would they stray from a worthwhile God to after worthless things? Didn't they know better? Didn't they know that God had saved them? Perhaps they've forgotten Perhaps they just forgot what God had done for them. You know how it is. These things happen. Like, life can get pretty crazy at times. The demands can be pretty uh, intense that you forgot about God. So maybe they just forgot that God had brought them out of the land of Egypt in Exodus chapter 2 verse 6. 
In, in, in fact, in Jeremiah 2, verse 6, you can hear those words. That God had rescued them from the years of bondage. That God had redeemed them from slavery. It is probably just slid to their minds that God had saved them. That God had done for them what they would never do it for themselves. They've forgotten who God is. Still, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Turning away from God when God had given them so much. Loved them so much. Provided so much for them. Forgetting about God when God had brought them into a plentiful land. A land that flows with milk and honey. A place of a life of full of potential and possibilities and goodness. They've forgotten about it. Forgetting about God when God had blessed them beyond measure. Giving them abilities and talents, comforts and luxuries. Peace and prosperity. Things nobody deserved. Things nobody can earn. They had been given so much and yet strayed from the one who had blessed them so much. Hard to imagine when you think about it. It's really hard to imagine. You would think would, uh, would have known better. You would think some would have remained faithful. But you can hear Jeremiah's point here. He's saying the priest, perhaps maybe in the, the priest, maybe the professional holy people, the religious authorities, the pastors, the clergy, you'd think, okay, they would know better because they are religious people. After all, it wasn't their job to remember the tradition, to hold fast to the story, to cling close to God. How could they wonder? How could they stray the priest of all the people? Why? Why? Religion was their life. Handling the sacred text, immersing themselves in the law. Surely they must have remained faithful to God. Well, let me tell you first hand. In the religious business, things happen. Things happen in such a way that it often seems a lot more business than religious. You end up thinking that you are doing business rather than being the person who God has called. In fact, this job often seems as much about numbers and dollars as any other profession. We now think about only we are focusing on numbers of people who are coming to church. We are focusing on what we are doing rather than what God should be doing through us. And that is the point I want to drive on. Who God is and what God has done for us are topics is lost when the conversation turns to how many people came and how much some things cost. Watching our budgets, we are so much glued to our budgets that we cannot do anything beyond our budgets. We are so controlled by our budgets. Managing buildings, we want to manage our buildings, our church buildings, maintaining programs and squeeze out time for prayer and study and worship and service and faith. We forget about these things. In addition to the business side of religion, there is also the people. We are talking about the priests, we are talking about the pastors. What about the people? What about the people themselves? Wherever two or three are gathered, let also alone several hundred people gather. There will be a head feeling here. There is a head feeling. A misunderstanding there. A mistake, a disagreement, a grudge. That's where you find people beg bickering. That's where you find people fighting each other. That's where you find people making gossip. It's because these are people who have forgotten who God is. Egos get bruised and pride gets squashed and back bristle and lies get drawn. So being professional holy persons starts to feel more like being a referee or a traffic cop. We forget who we are and we end up not doing what God has called us to do. But surely in this time and this place, some should have remained close to God. What about the rulers? What about those who are in places? Because it says... All these governments are placed by God. Respect the government because they've been placed by God. What about these governments? Where are they? Should they have known better? Should they have remained steadfast to God? Should they have been wise enough to do the right thing? Should they have been counted on to follow God's law? What about the governments? Where are they? The rulers? What about the prophets? Where are they? These preachers of zeal and dedication who so often appear to be the only ones with the truth. The prophets who so often are the only ones who will take a stand and for what is right. These men and women who boldly proclaim God's word, whatever the cost, they have no fear. Wouldn't they remain true? Even more when so many have wondered, the prophets, the preachers would remain faithful to God's word. Where are they? Why are they gone? 
So the people have gone, the priests have gone, the governments have gone, and the prophets have gone. Everyone has gone away. Everyone has gone, gone after the things out of no words, so that themselves have become worthless. God watches. And what happens? God watches us, weeps and wonders if this has ever happened before. On verse 10, God is just believing us. Has a nation changed its God, even though there are no gods? He's asking the question. But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. In verse 11, what a sadness for God to watch this happen. What a tragedy to watch people who had so much squander is to completely. As children of God, they had everything. As those who have forsaken God, they have nothing. And they don't even know that they have nothing. They don't even know. They don't even know that they have forgotten God. Could there really be such a time, such a place, such a people? No wonder the heavens were uproared and shocked and utterly jostled in verse 12. For it is unbelievable that God's people would get so caught up in what they were doing. What they thought was important, what they thought was needed, what they thought all about who they were and who they were. It is amazing that people loved by God, called by God, blessed by God, would go after their own desires and whims and interests instead of what God had marked them for them, what God has given them. It is outstanding that those made in God's image who wrap themselves in images of their own making. You, when you think about it, that you are made in God's image and then you wander after idols, wanting to worship idols rather than worshiping God. It is incomprehensible that those created to glorify and enjoy God would instead glorify and gratify themselves. It is inconceivable that people given in fight and ultimate worth by God would themselves venture far and wide after the things that are worthless, giving themselves body and soul to the things that have no value, no profit, following after the mirage, following after the things they will never catch. Following after the things that will never give them satisfaction. What does that mean to us as people of God? No wonder the heavens were upheld and shocked and utter desolate. No wonder God was upset. No wonder God caused what they have done evil. For they forsaken God. They've turned away. They've turned away from the fountain of living water. In verse 18. No wonder God caused what they've done evil. They've turned away from God. How often in our own lives have we given up what is truly valuable for the chief stuff? Like routinely giving up time with our children for that time and a half over time pay. Or a trade infidelity in marriage for a temporary fleeting passion. That's when you are asked after how you enjoy it. You cannot even tell it. It's because it's gone. As one preacher remarked, I've never heard anyone at the end of their life say, I would have worked more hours. Or I wish I had wasted so much time playing with my kids. How often have we ourselves exchanged the glory of sunset for a recliner and the evening news? Then come matters of the spirit. How easily and readily we exchange an encounter with the Almighty for a sitcom and commercials or a morning Sunday worship for an extra hour in the sleep and we end up even not coming to church. Too many people have listened to the smooth talk and empty promises in the world around us. Too many of us have invested our lives in that which is useless and fleeting. In this text, Jeremiah addressed the mistakes of a religious people living in a religious society. He tells them they have deserted the God They've devoted to, they've turned away the fruits of their offerings, and their well had run dry. Their well had run dry. Can you hear what he says in, in, in the last verse? Two sins my people have committed. What are these two sins? Says Jeremiah, they forsaken the spring of living water and they've dug their own cisterns. They've dug their own wells, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That is what he says. We know about the broken cisterns. Broken cisterns are wells that cannot hold water. 
They have created, or we have created our own systems which cannot hold water. We have created our own systems which we cannot rely upon. We believe that money was all we needed. But when money can run out, we found out that it was a broken system which cannot hold water. We believe that the government will take care of us, but when government betray us, we'll find out that sometimes government is a broken system that cannot hold water. We believe in friends, and friends betrayed us. We believed in family, and family deserted us. We believe in ourselves, but we could not deliver ourselves. And we have discovered that we have these broken sisters. They cannot hold water. And while we believe these things, we have turned our backs on the springs of living water. You may ask, what is the spring of the living water? What is it in John 4, verses 13 and 14? Jesus was at the well and he gave an answer about the water to the woman of Samaria. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become him in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus is the spring of living water. He is the only source of our comfort. This is the water. This is the world spring of eternal life. This is the water that supplies the life to our church so that the church can provide the spirit life to the community in which it lives. But the question still remains, how do we find the water when we runs, when our well runs dry? We know where the water is. How do we find it? We need three things. We need discipleship. We need stewardship. We need fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Those are the three things we need. First, we must develop discipleship. Jeremiah 2 verse 1 talks about discipleship. In discipleship, you must be devoted. You must read the word, do the word, and change the world. In discipleship, you must love. It's easy to love everybody in the church. You have to learn to love everybody in the world. In discipleship, you must follow the Lord. Don't just worship the Lord. Follow the Lord. That is what is discipleship. Follow the Lord. Second, you must strive for stewardship. Jeremiah 2 verse 3 talks about stewardship. In stewardship, you must learn to give your first fruits. You give to the church because you love the Lord. How can you love somebody that you don't support? Husbands, how can you love your wives and not support them? Parents, how can you love your children and not support their schools? Christians, how can you love the Lord and not support the church? And when you strive for stewardship, you can build the walls of the well so the well won't run dry. It doesn't run dry. Third, you must have fellowship in the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 2, verse 2 and 4 says, The word of the Lord came to me and told me to proclaim to you. Finally, it says, Hear the word of the Lord. Fellowship means God speaks to me. And I speak to you. Fellowship means I give you God's word and you take God's word and give it to someone else. Who takes it and gives it to somebody else? So it's a relay, it's a continuous and broken chain that God has commanded us in fellowship with God. In conclusion, fellowship means you hear the word of God and you obey. And when you are in fellowship in the Holy Spirit, you have located the water. You have dug the well. It is now time to dip the bucket down into the deep. Deep down into the spirit. Deep down below the surface. Now you find satisfaction. Only in Jesus. Stay and remain in Jesus. May God bless you all. May God continue to help you understand that you should never desert God who has created you to be what you are. Be. Be contented with what God has provided you with. May God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is with a grieving heart that we be, come before you to plead for our national leaders who have been so deceived by the satanic systems that has relegated God to the rooms of irrelevant. 
as we pray for Christendom, in particular for the shocking way that we have allowed the world to so influence our thinking to the extent that we have lost sight of who we are in Christ. Look down on us with pity and mercy, we pray. May you graciously black men from the brains before the great terrible day of the Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, don't forget the time for stewardship. It's all about God. You need to support the work of God for the work of God to continue. For this church to go on, for us to continue preaching, for the world to continue knowing that God is there, God exists, it's only through your giving. May God bless you as you continue with your giving. It's time to make your offering. The account details have been put there for you to follow. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity. We thank you that you have called us to the ministry of stewardship where when we think about what God has done for us, we find that even what we give is too little. But Lord, bless our offerings. Bless our time. Bless the hands that are so willing and loving you, prepared to give you. Thank you, Lord. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you wherever you are from now and evermore. Amen. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs>